Looking for ways to stay active this fall? Connectra has got you covered. Check out our abilities dance, chair yoga, and adaptive fitness classes on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Go to connectra.org slash events to learn more and add some movement into your weekly routine. This podcast is brought to you by Reimagine Radio, the online radio station that aims to give you information on disability and music. My name's Graham Wyman, and I'm the program manager for Connectra, Digga, and the Vancouver Adaptive Music Society. Today on our artist feature on Reimagine Radio, I am joined by Joe Coughlin and Dave Symington. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you doing today? Just fine, thank you, Graham. Glad to hear. I'm doing great. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day over here on Vancouver Island. Yeah. And um, I'm talking to two uh, fellow musicians and friends. What What could be better? <laughs> well, well, thank you, Joe. Yeah, no, it's uh, couldn't ask for being in better. person, maybe. Yes, that is that's a good point. Oh well. Soon oh, enough. Well. Soon enough. So, Joe, um, we wanted to have you back on the artist feature because you just finished recording uh, your latest record. And uh, to start us off, I was wondering, when you approached this record, what were some of the themes or ideas that stood out to you? Well, you know, the last time we spoke was in uh, uh, around mid-May. Yeah, correct. And this thing just kind of fell out of the heavens. <laughs> it absolutely did. Okay. I was talking to, I have a publicist in Toronto, and uh, we were yakking on the phone, and she said, you know, my husband, Terry Clark, who I've worked with on many occasions over the years, and he was on my debut album 40 years ago. Right. He's uh, Terry and Bernie Sinensky, who also was on my debut, debut album 40 years ago. Um, it, it, he's a piano player. And Neil Swainson, who's a guy from Victoria, but lives in Toronto. And I've worked with him many times, too. Uh, they're all coming out to do a project for Ryan Oliver, who's a tenor saxophone player who is originally from uh, Williams Lake, but studied up at uh, VIU in Nanaimo under uh, Pat Coleman, one of my uh, guitar player friends. Mm -hmm. And he has a great education. He's a wonderful tenor player. And he lives here in Victoria now. Okay. So we've been kicking around this idea for the last few years. Actually, I'll tell you its origins. <laughs> it was 2007, uh, I met Kurt Elling. Do you know who Kurt Elling is? He's a, a jazz singer from, from Chicago. I personally, and he's know. you know he's won lots of Grammys. You know he's quite a uh, he has a very international career. So he was up here doing a concert in a master class, and I attended his master class, and um, I gave him I think it was my fifth album that had come out at that point. So I gave him a copy, and he, he said to me, "So so Joe, uh, what do you got going on next? What's your next project?" I said, "You know I'm thinking about the Johnny Hartman and." Uh, John Coltrane record, kind of redoing that, with, you know, with an, an homage to it, but certainly trying to put our own stamp on it. And I said, you know, that, that record, which is famous, was recorded in 1963, and it was out on the Impulse uh, label, but it was recorded when stereo was, was just in its infancy. Right. So the way it sounds today, I, I think it hopefully has been remastered at some point. But it was always, you know, like uh, McCoy Tyner is the piano player. He's over on the left side and Coltrane's over on the right side and the drums and the bass and the vocals are right in the middle. You know, they just, it was so panned so strangely <laughs> yeah, that it always kind of drove me a little nuts when I listened to that record. I said, I just want to take a crack at it. And, you know, Johnny Hartman is a great singer, uh, but he didn't have the kind of career that, that say, Nat Cole had mm -hmm. because in the 1960s, most of the South was still segregated and mm -hmm. you know he just didn't have that kind of a career but he, he had an international career uh but he just never made it that that big um even though he's a, a terrific singer and an artist and uh, so anyway i i told this to kurt and that i had this project planned so it, again it started in 2007 <laughs> and it took till 
2021 to get it done. So it was 2017, I should say. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it was 2007. I'm right. Okay. And uh, it was the last year my mom was alive. So she passed away at that point. So uh, a little after that, she actually came to the concert with me. So anyway, I, I attended his master class. And uh, a year later, he comes out with a tribute to Johnny Hartman and John Coltrane. Uh, on his label, and it wins the Grammy Award. Oh, wow. So I guess, you know, never tell another male jazz singer what you're up to next. <laughs> right, right. So that's, that's how it started. And then uh, Ryan and I have been kicking it around. We're going to do it locally, and we've actually done a few of the songs uh, live at Herman's Jazz Club over here a couple of years ago now. And he does an annual uh, Johnny Coltrane, John Coltrane tribute uh, thing that John, uh, Ryan does. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, and when I heard that the, these three guys were coming out from Toronto to work with Ryan, I called Ryan and Corey Weeds, the label guy over in Vancouver who runs Seller Live, whether or not they would be interested in, you know, tagging a couple of extra days onto their schedule that week and I'll fit the bill and we'll go into the warehouse and record some of these tunes. Because I had all the charts for these, these songs, so... So I, I just cobbled together a whole bunch that we actually did 17 songs in a couple of oh, days. Wow. And, and, you know, so I, that's not going to be out in the CD, but, uh, you know, I'll just pick the best ones. And, you right. know, some of them are really very, very fine recordings. And, you know, we always have a couple of stinkers in the bunch, right. <laughs> which I won't put out. Gotcha. They'll, they'll put it out after I croak. Right, right. Just like uh, we'll call it uh, Joe's Vault, like Prince. Yeah, Frank's, <laughs> Frank's <laughs> Vault, yeah. Um. Can you tell me a little bit? I'm just curious. I want to talk more about the album and the process and everything. But what what was the master class like? Like what? Uh, you see, for me, having known you for such a long time, I think you're the master. But of course, I know we all have new things to learn. So what what happened? And was it a one day thing or? No, it, was an it was an afternoon. It was before in the afternoon. I think around three thirty or four o'clock before his, you know, and he did a sound check after that and uh, did a concert. And I had a ticket to the concert that uh, later that night. It was at a, a, an old church here that they've converted into a, a concert hall uh, called, uh, what's it called? Is that I think a, I know the one. I can't think of yeah, the name. It's on, it's on uh, Pandora Street. Is that the Victoria Conservatory? Yeah, it's with the conservatory. It's yeah. their auditorium. Yeah, I've seen the, it's a beautiful space. Yeah, it's about 880 seats, but it's, you know, the seating is a little weird, especially for a wheelchair uh, user. Uh, it's in the back corner, so you never get stereo. If there's a stereo uh, mix, you're never going to hear that. And uh, so that particular night, the house manager wasn't there. So I had mom and dad, uh, mom and, and my sister, Patty, were with me, and we sat in the front row, and I sat right in the aisle. And had the house manager been there, he wouldn't have let me sit there, but they let me sit there that night. So I was in the front row for the show, glaring at, at Kurt Elling. That's great. But the, the master class was, um, you know, there's quite a few students that had come down from Nanaimo at the university. And there was a few singers from uh, local singers, too. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was um, you know, things that you can do in the presentation and... Uh, uh, how to come on stage that was interesting hmm. um he basically suggests that everybody who comes out on stage uh, open up their arms and give everybody a big giant hug in the audience mm -hmm. this you know this was his his advice to us i've never done that <laughs> <laughs> you tell jokes <laughs> well you know what I, I try to uh, i think what what my biggest concern is that people will see me rolling out on my wheelchair and automatically think it's it's a some kind of a freak show that you know we're going to have some dancers and, you know some weird stuff going to go on so you try and uh, level yourself with a bit of humor self usually self deprecating humor to get the audience on your side but uh, sometimes but, it works but, but you have an incredible rapport with the audience i i always think that and you seem just so uh comfortable hey, are you <laughs> I, I mean well because you always start you know really strong and it doesn't peter out you you go for the whole show 
And I'm always impressed by your energy and your enthusiasm and your your rapport. You know, I'm sure that's something you probably feel you've developed over the years, but uh, you've been in the front a long time. Yeah, well, you know, again, I, we have this in common that we both. I started out on drums when I was a kid, and I think I talked about that in the last interview. But uh, you know, switching over to vocals at about I, I think I was. 16. Uh, you know, my voice had changed after being a soprano in the school choir, uh, you know, and I got into the adult uh, choir at church and uh, realized that I could actually, you know, I, I had pitch. I could actually sing in tune. So it, that, that comes from my mom. My mom was very musical, came from a very musical family. They all sang. They all had beautiful voices, my uncles. They were all really talented people. And uh, they, it was the generation, her uncles, and her father would get together and sing the barbershop stuff in four part harmony when she was a kid. So it, it and, and yet my, my dad's side of the family has no musical talent at all. We used to say, my dad has relative pitch. He said he has to be singing with a relative to be in tune. <laughs> I think our families are very alike. <laughs> are they? Yeah. So, you know, some, some half of the family had absolutely no musical DNA and the other was just you know teeming with it my cousins on that side of the family all play music instruments mm -hmm. and two of my cousins were uh, in the Montreal Opera they were you know they were in the, in the, the cast of, uh, of thousands I'm sure but uh, they both have very beautiful voices still that's uh, that's awesome <laughs> we don't have any singers we got piano players and drummers a lot of drummers yeah, yeah. Throw. Well, you know, uh, Jim Burns is a pretty decent singer, so uh, I think I could learn a lot from that guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, no, I mean my family. Oh, sorry. And your family. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I didn't, thought was, I didn't you mean... were talking about the Vams family. Uh, <laughs> no, that's a whole other. It's a whole oh. different trip. <laughs> a much bigger family. Uh, uh, yeah. No, it's that's a pretty family. It's pretty it's diverse. A... Yeah. yeah. It's a freak show. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think, you know, when I when I participate in the, in the variety stuff that you guys have done over the years, um, I, I think my only complaint was I only get to do two tunes. Right. You know, I want to do a whole concert and, uh, you know, get, getting two tunes in. And I've talked to Dwayne and all the folks about that. It just, you're just, you're not even warmed up. You know, you got to get warmed up to do that kind of stuff. But, you know, I mean, yeah, I like to dig in for a couple of hours at least. I think that's that's the most rewarding feeling, is that when you can sing for a couple of hours and and still feel relatively you know relatively fresh. Yeah, no, yeah. the uh, no the I've been to see you another a number of times uh, do those kind of shows, and you do seem fresh, relatively. <laughs> yeah, relatively. I, I've had some people come up to me say, you know, the last couple of tunes. You looked a little tired. I said, well, you would be too if you just did what I did for two hours, <laughs> knuckleheads. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Knuckle thanks, for the, thanks for the comments. Uh, yeah. Um, so, Joe, getting, yes. back to the, getting back to the record, um, I guess you kind of alluded to the arrangement, but I just wanted to be uh, clear on that. So was uh -huh. this sax, piano, drums, and bass in your yep. voice? So, okay. So... Uh, and, and was that always the vision? You didn't have an idea of it, whether it would be a bigger band, full band? You always had a very clear vision for this one? Well, for this particular record, because that's what Johnny, you know, mm -hmm. Johnny Harbin and John Coltrane's record is in four Okay. And then you mentioned the warehouse studio where you recorded this. Um, uh, now, did you, uh, did you have any other studios in mind or was it always, did you always want to record at the warehouse? Well, you know, th thanks to you guys, I got to record there in, uh, what was that, 2017, David? For the Strong Sessions. Oh, I think it was earlier than that. 2013, uh, right? Maybe 2015. Okay. Come okay. around there. All right. Yeah. Hmm. All right. You know, when you get to be my age, you lose track of the past. <laughs> I know four years doesn't seem that long right now, so I I, I think it's a bit earlier. Is it earlier than that? Okay, well I I'd have to check my contract. 
Exactly. Yeah. As we are too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm checking my contract. Um, so I got to do that and, and we went in there with, uh, you know, I had a trio, mm -hmm. uh, Miles Black, uh, Miles uh, Hill on bass. Okay. Pat Coleman came over from Nanaimo on guitar and uh, Bob Murphy, God rest his soul, on piano. And I, you know, I've known Bob for a dog's age and, and every time we got to play together, it was, uh, he's, he's an ethereal kind of piano player. I just love the way he plays. And, and to sing with him was like sitting in a big, comfortable power wheelchair mm -hmm. <laughs> with your own, with your own specialized cushions. Yeah. <laughs> Massage <laughs> functions. Yeah. Like he, he was, he was just soulful and just so tuned in and just an amazing guy. Yeah. And there was like a really oh. strong, uh, communication that day between, you know, I could see everybody, uh, that that's essential, especially when you're recording live off the floor, like we do, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of recording is, you know, done piecemeal. And I just, I can't ever think of that, uh, because I want to have, a, a the ability to capture the performance mm -hmm. of four people or five people at that, you know, on Thursday, uh, given her all, cause you know, this doesn't disappear. This lasts forever. And you want it to be your best effort. That's all it is. And uh, I don't, you know, and the fact that I can, um, you know, get up to the, the second floor studio, the, the studio two, which is the big one. Mm -hmm. And it's got that you Rupert Neve console from air studios mm -hmm. that uh, George Martin put up for sale and mm -hmm. Brian Adams bought it. God bless his soul. Yeah. I mean, there's only four of those in the world. I know. It's and that, you know, that's got that reputation of having that, uh, that kind of warmth. And, and Terry Clark, the drummer on the session said to me, he said, you know, I really liked what Sheldon Zaccaro did, the engineer. He really knows how to mic a set of drums, especially a set of jazz drums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, it's, you know, it's a big room with 30 feet of ceiling, mm -hmm. but it still has this incredible intimate feeling and sound which is which is really important for you know especially that kind of a, a record that you're doing yeah uh, sheldon uh, the engineer said to me the other thing about this room is there's um and i, and I think it was best uh explained by um john uh, uh phillips the guy from mamas and the papas he said when all four of us are singing together a fifth voice comes out of those four voices and it's up at the top of the ceiling. And when you're recording live off the floor, you kind of get that, that presence. Right. So um, again, an intimate sounding record, but a whole bunch of air around it, mm -hmm. which, which yeah. really in, in a jazz record, it, you know, quartet or a tree or a tree or whatever it is um, really makes it sound exceptional. Now, touching on your point, um, I always, I, I've, I've changed my mentality, but when I was in college, um, Neil Young had a saying that, you know, as you said, records nowadays are really put together and there's not really a live setting. So when I was at Berkeley, I always wanted to find groups that you could capture because Neil's Neil said, you know, I don't want to do something that I can't replicate live. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look at what those, you know, some of those pop records that are put together today, I mean, they sound amazing and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But how do you play that live? Right, exactly. Backing tracks. And the drummer then is playing to a click track mm -hmm. in his headphones. Yeah. And that is also synced up with some computer for the lighting cues. So all of that stuff doesn't really lead uh, an improviser like myself mm -hmm. uh, to happiness. Let's put right. it that way. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I just, I couldn't see doing that the same thing over and over every night. And I would imagine some of these intricate dance moves that these folks are doing. Uh, if I ever did that, I'd have a heart attack. You know? <laughs> if I ever saw it, I'd have a heart attack. Yeah, I'd have a heart attack. <laughs> but you know, they're, and they're, they're not singing. There's mm -hmm. no way that you can sing when you're jumping up and down like that. Right. 
No, you know, I, I've never tried it, but you know, the reality is you just, you know, they're lip syncing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I've done that too for television. It's, it's a drag. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just not fun. Yeah, our videos, it's the same thing. You're often mm -hmm. just singing along to the track they're playing in the room. Yeah, I, I found that, uh, I, I don't know if I told you this, but I used to sing the national anthem at the, um, Blue Jays games every once in a while. I lived in Toronto, and uh, okay. there was a about a two second delay between what you sang and what came over the public address system in right. the in the background. Mm -hmm. It was very disconcerting uh, to try and concentrate on what you're doing and not listen to the <laughs> playback. Right. So uh, they would have us record the track and then go out in the field and lip sync. And I did that once. Right. And I told him the next time, I said, you know, I don't want to, if you ever ask me back, I want to do it live. Oh, we only let uh, Gordon Lightfoot and Burton Cummings and Michael Burgess do it live. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to do it live too and see what you think. Yeah. And, you know, it's <laughs> fraught with terror, <laughs> absolute terror going out there. And then luckily I got to do it at the Sky Dome, the Rogers Center uh, a few times too. Mm -hmm. And there was a monitor there. So you had a monitor and... I tell you, you know, wireless microphone that was terrific, and you know, singing in front of fifty thousand people a couple of times is pretty cool. Oh, I'm sure that's special. Amazing. So I uh, I listened to the you sent us a few tracks mm. to review. Mm -hmm. They sound absolutely awesome. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's got that. It's like there's another there's a different feel to it. I kind of expected it to sound a little more closed in, you know, like a little tight, but it's got that, you know, it's, I mean, it is live and it just sounds amazing. And I, I'm just, how are you feeling about it? You're happy? With the sound, yeah. And and Sheldon, mm -hmm. like, like Corey Weeds, uh, the producer of the session, he recommended uh, Sheldon. He says he's the only guy I want to work with. And the feedback that came back from the musicians, you know, those guys have all been recording for 50 years. Uh, you know, Terry and Bernie and, and Neil. And Neil, right. not so much, but, you know, 40 years probably for Neil, too. He's about my age. And um, Neil said, you know, I loved it because I didn't have to use an amplifier. Right. So we got a true acoustic sound on that and on his bass. Okay. And he's using Russ, Russ, Russ Botton's bass. Russ is a you know connoisseur of fine bass is a wonderful player himself in vancouver and um i i sent him a note and thanked him for the use of his bass because it sounds fantastic on this record mm -hmm. and, and neil was very very happy and you know that the yamaha c7 in there is is a very lovely piano too and bernie liked to play it so and you know it i i'm sure I'd, i don't know if you guys know this but i was speaking with sheldon after I think it was on Thursday afternoon. I, we were wrapping up the day, and uh, we we're chatting in front of the board in the in the control room. And he said, um, "So, Joe, have you, have you recorded any place else?" So I named off quite a few studios that I'd recorded, and he said, "Oh, I'm a clear place in Toronto." Eh? I said, "Yeah, I did my first three records there." He said, "Well, uh, that microphone that you used today, that you like, that you've used before here, it was I. I said it was a U87." That was wrong. I was okay. wrong in the last interview, Graham. I okay. said it's actually uh, Neumann M49. Okay. And okay. it's a huge diaphragm. Yeah. This yeah. thing has got a huge diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it just is the warmest sounding intimate microphone. And you can really pump a lot of action sure. in it. So okay. it's not going to it's not going to break up on you. So. so he said that was purchased at the auction. Uh, when McClear Place huh. closed down in Toronto. Of course. So it's probably the same microphone I used when I was in that studio recording three of my albums. That's amazing. It's been following it's unbelievable. you. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's been following you. <laughs> so it's a connection I have with the guy that I met at McClear Place. He was the owner, mm -hmm. uh, Phil Sheridan, who, in my opinion, uh, was one of the best recording engineers for jazz that the world has ever seen. He, he's right up there with, uh, uh, from my memory's not good today, the, oh geez, Phil's his first name. 
not not Spectre, the other guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was where I was going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's not. Like, I didn't know he did a bunch oh, of jazz. Terrible. <laughs> oh well. Phil, mm-hmm. Phil, Phil. Who else did he work with? Well, it, Phil recorded all the Boss Brass records, and uh, you know, he's, he he. I I always bugged him to write a book because he was kind of at the forefront working at uh, Heritage and Thunder Sound and all those places. When the Canadian scene started to develop in the late 60s, early 70s, like it started to break outside of Canada. And, you know, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, all those kind of folks, okay. you know, they kind of put Canada on the Matt Gordon Lightfoot, all those kind of things. Okay. But he recorded Lighthouse's first couple of records because he knew how to record horns. And um, he just had an amazing career. Uh, unfortunately, he was a, a brittle diabetic. Okay. And uh, died of a heart attack at 63. Was his name Phil Sheridan? Phil Sheridan, yeah. Okay. And and that Phil and and I, he worked on my first album okay. to do some uh, some fix-ups. Mm-hmm. And uh, I met him, and we just became fast friends. And he did the next uh, three or four of my records, I think. Okay. He engineered them. He's a, we became fast friends. And, you know, we used to drink a lot of scotch together back in those days, which he shouldn't have done. Right. And neither of should I have by that way, but <laughs> that's, that's another story. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. Um, so speaking hey, enjoyed of... it when you did. That's the... So sorry? sorry? Sorry, David? You, you enjoyed it when you did. As did oh, I. God. I, I, yeah. loved, I loved having a cocktail or two. But, you know, I, I found that it uh, seriously impacted on my limited motor skills. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me... Uh, Prior to doing the recording, what did you, how do you prepare? How do you get your voice ready? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, scales, you know, and, and a lot of this is mental preparation, mm-hmm. surprisingly enough. Uh, trying to figure out, and plus, you know, I got a little setup here that I can actually sing into and, and you know, kind of match my approach to this kind of stuff mm-hmm. and you know hopefully it, it can pull it off but you know like i say there's a few of the t- tunes that uh, you know they're not going to hit the record right but you know i'm sure other people would hear them and say hey man that sounds pretty good but you know mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to put it up yeah you, I, you know, I got a, i got enough enough material that we, and plus the ballads the ballads <laughs> on the record and there's probably four or five of those uh maybe even yeah four, four or five they're all over six minutes long oh nice <laughs> you know so i don't think that they're gonna yet, yet there's a few that are you know uh, radio friendly tracks so uh we'll get some airplay but you know only the most ambitious uh programmer will put a six and a half minute tune on. but do you memorize all the lyrics or do you keep uh, it- well i i you know i have a fairly but in 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 a studio set, setting, I have the lyrics on a uh, on a sheet in front of me. Right. Uh, you know, and a lot of them I know fairly well. But you know, again, uh, that's my biggest problem as I'm getting older, is to retain uh, all that stuff in your head. Right. Yeah, you know, it's really really tough. And you know, Sinatra as he got older, he always had a teleprompter. But you know, those those things are expensive. I, right. I can't afford them. <laughs> so you know, a music stand is going to have to suffice, I guess. I, I would love to be able to say, you know, like Tony Bennett at, at 95 years of age, they can call, say, say a song to him in a key and he's, boom, he's got it. Got it yeah. But, you know, I, I've never been that good at that. And I think, you know, it's just a matter of practice too, I think. Sure. But I, I'm being honest with you. Yeah. I, I didn't memorize anything, especially <laughs> mathematics. I just couldn't remember. I was fortunate enough to, to be there a couple of days. And it was just an awesome experience to observe everything and to hear what was going on. And uh, I didn't notice. I, I knew you had charts in front of you. I, I didn't notice whether you had the lyrics or not. Yeah. And, uh, but I have to ask because uh, the way the week wrapped up uh, down at Frankie's, uh, when you went next door, and ended up singing a song, kind of last second thing. Yeah. How was that? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, that's a song I know, you know, like 
gold. But it was really funny. We did it, you know, the first, uh, it was a 16, it's just, just a 16 bar tune. And great uh, Johnny Burke and Jimmy Van Heusen tune called It Could Happen to You, which is on this record, by the okay. way. Because, um, uh, oh, that's, that's another interesting story. Because Johnny Hartman recorded that song, It Could Happen to You, on my 25th birthday oh. in, what was that, 19... 80 1980 was my 25th birthday and he died in february while i was in recording my debut album oh wow oh man so this is so that, kind of that's a... a heavy connection to it i just yeah. you know i just had to get this out of my soul right. this project yeah it's kind of so comes full circle a lot of fun yeah, yeah. um but yeah, well, you know, I, again i know that one well and you know I, again i know i can i can do you know whip it up for a couple of minutes anyway that's but we ended up playing that tune for 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody took a couple of courses and we right. just had a good time. It was a lot of fun. But had you performed? Uh, when was the last time you'd actually performed before that night? Uh, December of 2019. Wow. So it was extra special. Well, I think, you know, playing with those guys and the, the energy that they put out there, it's. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing experience. But anyway, I, I get through the first 16 bars and then we, you know, we're, you know, playing really light. And then the second time I go into the 16, it just really starts to roar. I can, these guys took off and I got this amazing hit of adrenaline okay. that just about blew that top of my head off. Right. And it was, I, I didn't know what it was because I haven't felt it for so right. long. Right, right. <laughs> and it, it just hit me so hard. I went, whoa, I guess this is kind of why I do this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to see the reaction of that crowd, it was just, uh, I, I hope I can get a chance to play there for all night at some point. But uh, I, I think I need a patron. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I sure hope you can, too, because it was it was just utterly amazing. Uh, I, I, know, I, I I don't think I've been to a live show myself for a while. So to be, you know, basically sitting at the front door, but inside, fortunately enough, beside the stage and watching that all unfold was just, it was delicious <laughs> in every way. Well, thanks, Dave. I appreciate no. it very much. I, I, like I say, it was, it was the, the you know, I could have, uh, Terry, uh, we talked a couple of days after he got home and, uh, Terry Clark, the drummer on the show, and he said, Joe, why don't you sit around for another couple of tunes? I said, you know what, man? You got to leave him wanting, wanting more. more. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> then he turned around and he says, no, that's not my motto. My motto is, I always leave them wanting less. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. now, well, you won. You did leave them wanting more. They were, they were up on their feet after you finished that tune. Yeah, well, you know, they haven't called me back. <laughs> I'm not even sure I'm, if they're I'm doing it. I'm still waiting right for the now. call. <laughs> right. Maybe you should uh, stop on listing your number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open. I'm an open book, David. You know that. I, know. I, I would like to be able to say to come over for, uh, you know, to make it worth my while. I just can't come over and do a one nighter right. unless it's going to pay me a few grand. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I just can't do that. Because I got, I got to pay a hotel, mm -hmm. and it's two hundred bucks for the ferry, and you know people. I think people who live on the mainland that never come to the island, they don't know how much it costs us to come to the mainland. No, I know. Yeah. Um, so Joe, um, yes, you're, finished, Graham. you're finished recording right now. Uh -huh. um, have you started the mixing process yet? And if so, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. that stuff I sent you is mixed. Oh, fully okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, and then so how did you how did you approach that aspect? Like you have the room, you have the recordings that you were happy with. How did you? What kind of? How, what was your trajectory when you when started mixing? Well, first of all, to see what we had. Right. I, I waited a month to hear this stuff. Okay. Because Shel Sheldon stacked up. Right. He yeah. said, Joe, you know, this kind of came in uh, at kind of the last minute. I'm glad we were able to do it. But I'm I'm booked solid for August. Right. And I'll get to it near the end of the month. Right. And uh, I've got everything now. And mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a few things that I have to tweak a little bit. But, um, mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, th that again is, you know, the, the danger of recording live off the floor right. is that uh, sometimes you catch what, what you missed mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't. Right. So that's the beauty of this technology is that it can be uh, used to um, manipulate the outcome. Right. Let's put it that way. Yeah. No. You know, I, I think if, you know, things get a little too long or something went on a little too long, if there's an, if there's an edit point at something, and again, I'm trying to make it as radio friendly as possible because, mm -hmm. you know, without radio play, you're not going anywhere. Right. Yeah. No, that's a very fair point. Very yeah. fair point. Now, um, I'm not sure if you know this, but um, do you know, maybe you can tell our listeners when we might expect the album to be released. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I, I hope in this in the spring. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it, it, once you record things, there's always that pressure, you know. Of course. What's okay. next? You know, I yeah. mean, this is a long process. Yeah. It's, it's not, not something it. that happens overnight. Mm-hmm. And you know the the push and pull of uh, uh, designing a, a jacket and all those kinds of things for the uh, for the CD, mm -hmm. and you know whether or not that's even necessary anymore, right, um, is is a question I always have to ask myself. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, are you going to do a run of uh, a couple of thousand, hundred and eighty gram virgin vinyl yeah. records? Because mm -hmm. the the recording process is, which is news to me. But, you know, I have enough friends in the business that they can tell me that this makes perfect sense electronically. Mm -hmm. Was you take a digital file, which some people complain is a bit brittle mm -hmm. in its sound, and you dump it onto quarter-inch analog tape, mm -hmm. and then you dump it back, back to digital. Yeah. And it warms the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what I'm trying to talk myself out of is this incredible expense now to have somebody in Nashville print you up a couple of thousand vinyl records mm -hmm. and the expense of that process too, right. which we used to do in the 1980s for a hell of a lot cheaper than it's done today mm -hmm. because we had plants all over the place, but they don't have those anymore. No, unfortunately not. I mean, I, I so, know. So the guys that are still running that kind of business are going to charge you whatever the hell they want to charge us. So. Mm -hmm. When was the last? But, you know, the other concern I do have is, you know, is for people who are audiophile, uh, we can now produce uh, high resolution files for folks mm -hmm. at uh, what is it, 98 hertz, kilohertz, as opposed to 44, 44. which are yeah. CDs. Mm -hmm. And then ultra, there's now an ultra at 124 yeah. kilohertz. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you go, where does this end? Never. No. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. You're, you're right. It's going to continue to go on. And I, right. you know, it's kind of way over my head because, you know, I, I still know how to cut tape yeah. on a tape block. You know, I know how to do that and splice tape together, but nobody knows that skill anymore. I know. Yeah, we actually had a course where we had to do that. And that it, it's I have such respect for it, but it is very time consuming, especially if you are a hair off from yeah. where you wanted to make that cut or edit. Yeah. Whereas it, you know, in Pro Tools now, that's that's a breeze. I can go, yeah, it's a couple of key commands. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, well, um, gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's always a blast to have you guys on the pod, and uh, yeah, thank you. Hey, my pleasure. Good to good to see you both. Well, sort of. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I could be part of it. Again, gents, have a great afternoon, and to all of our listeners out there, thank you for tuning in, and keep that music flowing.